When the fatal attraction between two bloodthirsty souls intertwine, chaos and destruction are born. Myra and Ian started off what seemed to be a normal relationship, which soon evolved into the gruesome rape and murder of five children. And with that, I'm Cassie. I'm Sarah. Now let's talk about the fatal attraction between Myra and Ian. Born on July 23rd, 1942 in Manchester, England, Myra Henley grew up with her grandmother after her sister was born. But before she left home, one thing her father did teach her was how to fight. And so like her mother, Myra learned how to defend herself against males her own age. And when she beat a boy in a street fight, her father gave her the attention and approval she craved. After the drowning death of a close male friend when she was 15, she left school and converted to Roman Catholicism. She became obsessed by sights from which others would recoil. A decapitated dog by a railway track, a cat torn in half by two dogs, and a boy bleeding to death after being crushed by a lorry. What it looks like is that Myra grew up kind of seeing love as violent. Mm -hmm. um, her f parents weren't really in the picture as much because they were at home with her sister and she was with the grandma. Yeah. But any kind of like attention she got from her father was like, I don't like kind of negative and a lot of it stemmed from like violence yeah from like her watching her dad beat her mom yeah but then like her mom fought back yeah eventually her dad kind of like trained her to fight well <sighs> mm -hmm. you know kind of like trained her to fight or whatever which i think for her that was kind of like a bonding experience with yeah her dad. so i feel like at a young age her view of love is like violence and violence nice is key to a man's yeah. heart yeah, like just not being nice to her, like not a normal relationship type thing, you know? Yeah. In 1961, she met Ian Brady, a stock clerk who was recently released from prison. She fell in love with him and soon gave herself over to his total control. She was very impressed when Ian read Hitler's autobiography in its original German, but he remained seemingly indifferent to her. The only times he showed emotion was when he exploded into sudden rages, often when his bookmaker rang with a bad result. These violent outbursts smeared her father's behavior as she became a woman, he encouraged her to read the works of the sexual sadist, the Marquis de Sade. Brady was her first lover, and he bit and beat her as he took her virginity. So, do you think Myra's attracted to Anne because he reminds her of her father? I think that it's definitely possible that she was attracted to him because, again, she grew up with knowing love as violent, and so she mm -hmm. sees, you know, this man was like relatively in my opinion attractive so you know that plus the violence that she kind of grew up around and like got um oh like the approval yeah from, you know it was kind of like a similar thing and i think she probably latched onto that she's like oh my gosh she's the total package looks and violent yeah i mean she probably didn't think about it that way but it was probably some, kind of like you know when you smell something that reminds you of like a happy memory yeah even though those most of those members probably weren't happy, but like bonding with her father about like fighting mm -hmm. and stuff, like maybe it was like something like that that triggered her in her mind that she's like, oh, this guy could be a good significant other. But I don't know because he definitely seems like a strange guy because he didn't really show emotion. I don't think and so. And pay because, attention to her. No, because it said he was like indifferent to her, which like is like, like she's kind of there. Yeah. Which. I don't know, you would think would be red flags, but again, if she's seeing violence as love. Testing her blind allegiance, Ian hatched plans of rape and murder. In July 1963, they claimed their first victim, Pauline Reed. Sometime after 7.30 p.m. on Foxbridge Street, Ian signaled Myra to stop for 16-year-old Pauline Reed, and Myra offered her a lift. At various times, Myra gave conflicting statements about the extent to which she versus Ian was responsible for Pauline being selected as their first victim, but said she felt that there would be less attention given to the disappearance of a teenager than of an eight-year-old. Once Pauline was in the van, Myra asked her to help in searching Saddleworth Moore for an expensive lost glove. Pauline agreed and they drove there. When Ian arrived on his motorcycle, Myra told Pauline he would be helping in the search. She later claimed that she waited in the van while Ian took Pauline into the moor. He returned alone after about 30 minutes and took Myra to the spot where Pauline lay dying. Pauline's clothes were in disarray and she had been nearly decapitated by two cuts to the throat, including a four inch incision across her voice box, inflicted with considerable force, and into which the collar of her coat and a throat chain had been pushed. 
When Myra asked Ian whether he had raped Pauline, he replied, of course I did. Myra stayed with Pauline while Ian retrieved a spade he had hidden nearby on a previous visit. He turned to the van while he buried Pauline. It sounded like not far into their relationship, Ian kind of was like, let's try out murdering children. And Myra didn't really, at least what we're reading, didn't really seem to care. She was kind of like on board with it. Yeah, because she didn't want to lose him. I guess, like, I don't know. I feel like, I mean, I don't know. I guess if you think about it in her brain, like, she already is down for, like, violence and, like, mm -hmm. actual violence and stuff like that. So maybe that didn't, like, seem any different. But I just feel like... I don't know if you're in a relationship with someone and they were like, hey, will you want yeah, somebody like, with me? Yeah. I don't know. Like, especially it doesn't seem like she has like a lot of mental illnesses. Maybe we just don't no. know about them, but. No, I think, you know, just the violence. Yeah. And like her infatuation with him. Yeah. Like it says she's her, his, let me restart that. It said that he was her first lover and like yeah basically like the love of her life yeah and maybe like with the whole violence thing it like kind of turns into like the like loving your abuser and stuff mm -hmm. like that so maybe that's just what it was but i just think it's crazy for someone to be yeah. like hey let's go feel it murder people together but and then they respond yeah okay yeah i'm down i don't know you gotta be pretty twisted yeah um and then later on in this little section we talk about how their first victim, Pauline, Ian goes off with her to murder her and Myra just stays in the van. No. I'm gonna be honest, like, I don't think- This is what she said happened. Yeah. So that's not necessarily what actually happened, it could just be what she's claiming. Mm -hmm. But I think it's weird that she would have stayed in the van because she was so interested about the decapitated dog and the, and the cat, cat and the, and the yeah. boy that got hit. Yeah. For her so, to just like tap out? Yeah. I don't unless know. she didn't want, unless she knew that he was gonna rape Pauline and she didn't want to see that part. Oh, that's true because she was in love with him. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. maybe seeing him with other people is like, mmm. Yeah. But she still, feels. I do agree though. I feel like weird. it is weird that she wouldn't want to be there to see Pauline yeah. get nearly decapitated. You know, she's so in love with this guy that if she doesn't see it, she can kind of. She doesn't yeah. believe it, I guess. Or she's incredibly smart, and if she doesn't go and like participate hey, like that, she thinks like she won't get she, in trouble. Yeah, she can kind of get away with it. I yeah. don't know if she is smart enough for that. I don't think I so. I don't know about like much of her mm -mm. young childhood and growing up and stuff, but I don't know. I think it's definitely weird that she stayed in the van, though. Yeah. Four months later, in the early evening of November 23rd, 1963, Ian and Myra offered 12-year-old John Kilbride a lift home, saying his parents might worry that he was out so late and also promised him a bottle of sherry. Once John was inside Myra's hired car, Ian said they would have to make a detour to their home for the sherry. While they were driving, Ian suggested another detour, this time to search for a glove Myra had lost on the moor. When they reached the moor, Ian took John with him while Myra waited in the car. Ian sexually assaulted John and tried to slit his throat with a six-inch serrated blade before strangling him with a shoelace or string. Early in the evening of June 16, 1964, Myra asked 12-year-old Keith Bennett, who was on his way to his grandmother's house in Longsight, for help in loading some boxes into her car, after which she said she would drive him home. Ian was in the back of the van waiting. Myra drove to a lay-by on Saddleworth Moor and Ian went off with Keith supposedly looking for a lost glove. After about 30 minutes, Ian returned alone, carrying a spade that he had hidden there earlier and in response to Myra's questions, he said that he had sexually assaulted Keith and strangled him with a piece of string. Ian and Myra visited a fun fair in Ann Coates on December 26, 1964, and noticed that 10-year-old Leslie Ann Downey was apparently alone. They approached her and deliberately dropped some shopping bags they were carrying, then asked for her help in taking the packages to their car and then to their home. At the house, Downey was undressed, gagged, and forcibly posed for photographs before being raped and killed, perhaps strangled with a piece of string. Myra later maintained that she went to fill a bath for Leslie Ann and found her dead when she returned. Ian claimed that Myra killed her. 
The following morning, Ian and Myra drove Leslie Ann's body to Saddleworth Moor and buried her, naked with her clothes at her feet in a shallow grave. So after reading about these last couple kids, it shows that he doesn't really care about gender. He just goes for it. No, I think a lot of the um, serial killers we look at, especially the males, like tend to, mm-hmm. st- I feel like a lot of times stick to one gender when it comes to kids, but it looks like Ian doesn't really care. No, it's like, it doesn't matter female, male. Yeah, but it looks like in every case, like his end goal is to rape them. Rape them and strangle them with yeah. a string. string, basically. Yeah. They murdered her somewhere different. They actually did it in their house, which was kind of weird because it's like different from their MO. Yeah, I, th- I don't know why they would have done that. Maybe they thought it would be easier maybe I don't, closer yeah i, I was gonna say well, maybe it's because it's a girl but pauline they yeah they, they murdered, murdered her in saddle so birth. i don't know why they would have done that maybe they had like a different scenario planned out that they wanted to do that involved yeah being at home um don't know why they would change it up maybe it was like exciting to them to like, try it out I mean, and like in their relationship kind of like Maybe they were getting stale and they're like, let's do it at home. Yeah, you know? something different. Yeah. On the evening of October 6th, 1965, Myra drove Ian to Manchester Central Railway Station, where she waited outside in the car whilst he selected a victim. After a few minutes, Ian reappeared in the company of 17-year-old Edward Evans, to whom he introduced Myra as his little sister. He later claimed that he had picked up Edward for a sexual encounter. They drove to their home in Wardle Brook Avenue, where they relaxed over a bottle of wine. At some point, Ian sent Myra to fetch David, her brother-in-law. Throughout the previous year, Ian had been cultivating a friendship with David, who had become in awe of Ian, something that increasingly worried Myra as she felt it compromised their safety. Myra returned with David and told him to wait outside for her signal, a flashing light. When the signal came, he knocked on the door and was met by Ian, who asked if he had come for the miniature wine bottles and left him in the kitchen saying that he was going to collect the wine. David then watched Ian throttle Edward with a length of electrical cord. Ian sprained his ankle in the struggle and Edward's body was too heavy for David to carry to the car on his own, so they wrapped him in plastic sheeting and put him in the spare bedroom. David then went to the police with his story, including Ian having mentioned that more bodies were buried on Saddleworth Moor. I think it's interesting that Ian would want to include David at all because like why let somebody else in? If what you're doing already is working, why include him? And to say like how it says that um, Ian was kind of cultivating a friendship with him, Mm -hmm. I also find that weird because the way Ian seems is very like antisocial. Yeah, like doesn't care about Mm emotions, like doesn't have emotions, doesn't care about other people. Like the only thing he cares about is is what he wants. Yeah, what he yeah. wants, and that's to satisfy yeah. himself by yeah. murdering. And so I just think it's weird that he would be like, oh yeah, let's have David come in on this. Meyer was also like, not into it. No, she was jealous. I, yeah, I know it says like, she felt that it compromised their safety, which I think to some extent she was like, oh, he's gonna like rat us out or whatever. But I also do think that she was probably jealous that maybe Ian was like, into David yeah because like clearly like we talked about gender doesn't really matter to Ian no so she was probably like thinking that oh my gosh she's gonna try to get with David yeah and that's a no-no I don't know it's just strange there's they're strange it's a strange dynamic I feel like Myra and Ian were brought to trial on April 27th 1966 where they pleaded not guilty to the murders of Evans Downey and Kilbride Ian was found guilty of the murders of Downey Kilbride and Evans while Myra was found guilty of the murders of Downey and Evans and for harboring Ian in the knowledge that he had killed Kilbride. They were both jailed for life. In 1970, Myra severed all contact with Ian and still professing her innocence, began a lifelong campaign to regain her freedom. In 1987, she again became the center of media attention with the public release of her full confession in which she admitted her involvement in all five murders. Her subsequent applications for parole were denied and she died of respiratory failure on November 16, 2002. Myra severed all contact with Ian after they went to jail. I am shocked. Yeah, 
Me too, because like she, like I said before, it was kind of like when people tend to fall in love with their abuser or whatever. Mm -hmm. So generally, like the separation of that is like not easy. No. So for her just to be like, see, I mean, it could be because they didn't see each other for a long time. And so maybe she was like, oh, he's not good for me. Like maybe once she was away from it all, she realized she could, yeah, she that, could see that like, it wasn't oh good. my gosh. Or maybe she got counseling and they were like, that's not normal relationship stuff. Yeah. I don't know, but I definitely wouldn't have thought that would have happened. I would have figured that it'd be kind of like a, like a back and forth star cross lover lovers yeah. letters to each other, yeah. or at least her sending him a ton of letters. Yeah, I'm not really caring. Yeah. yeah. Then at the same time, it's like, was she really involved in all of this? Like, I know we talked about how she kind of sat in the car. She was definitely like, oh, what's the word? An accomplice. Yeah, she was definitely an accomplice because she helped. She helped like kidnap them, kidnap and them, pick them up. Knew about it, and yeah, knew about it. But um, the way she's been telling it, she would stay in the car, not watch. I don't know which. Like I get, like maybe she didn't have like an actual hand on the weapon mm -hmm. that killed the children, but at the same time, like I feel like she would still watch though, like just out of curiosity, like. If she had been so curious about that little boy that was hit by the truck and she was like wanting to see that, I'm just very surprised that she wouldn't have been what? curious yeah. again. At least one of the times or a couple of the times. Yeah. You know, maybe the first time she would have been like a little leery of it because it's the first it was their and first she, murder. She clearly has emotions, you know. Mm -hmm. So she's not a complete what is it, psychopath, sociopath? So one of those. Whichever one it is. Um I don't know. I find it interesting because of the whole like Dynamic between yeah, Myra and Ian. Yeah, because I don't know. It just reminds me so much of like I keep saying the loving your abuser or kind of like Stockholm syndrome sort of. Yeah. Like I don't know. I I don't know. I feel I don't know why I just thought of this, but like the psycho version of like Romeo and Juliet for some reason. Like this kind of the, yeah yeah kind of like the dark version. Like you know how all of the. Most of the fairy tales are actually dark. Yeah. Yeah, kind of like that. If you want to hear about another crazy murder duo, make sure you check out our video on the Menendez brothers. It's going to be right here. We will see you guys next week. Peace.